Let me invite you to turn your Bibles, please, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We're continuing a series of sermons that we've simply entitled, Jesus the Great I Am. In the Old Testament, when God revealed himself to the people of Israel, Moses said, what's your name? He said, I am who I am, the great I am. And it's a name that highlights the the self-existence, the sovereignty of God over all things. It's one of the most sacred covenant names of God in all of the Bible. And what's interesting, as we've seen, is that Jesus applied that sacred covenant name of God to himself. And he not only used that name of himself, that he said, I am the great I am, but he rounded out that name with a number of character qualities that we're going to look at over the next several weeks. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life and I'm the true vine. And in each of these names, he revealed something unique, something special, something powerful and comforting about his character to us. And this morning, it'll be our privilege to look at that statement where he said, I am the light of the world. So let's just bow our heads as we look into God's word this morning. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful that every time we open its pages, you speak to us. And so, Lord, um, give us open ears and open hearts to receive your truth. We pray that you would convict us, challenge us, change us, do whatever your spirit desires in our hearts and lives this morning. We just ask that all that I do and say would be true to your word and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's a little village in Switzerland, or rather in Austria, called Rattenburg. It's actually the smallest town in Austria. It has only about 400 people, and it has gotten smaller each and every year. People are just moving out of this town by the droves. And why is that, right? It looks like a nice picturesque European little village. Why is it so small? Why are people moving out of this beautiful little picturesque European town? Well, the reason (coughs) is darkness, darkness. Rattenburg is nestled behind Rat Mountain which is a 3,000-foot elevation that blocks out the sunlight from this little town several months out of the year. From about November to February, this little town sits in virtual darkness. It's almost like it's nighttime all the time, and, and that's very unsettling for people. People weren't made to live in the dark, and so people are, are moving out by the dozens every year. Um, but gratefully, thanks to some clever technology, there's hope for this little town, there's an Austrian company called Bartenbach Lichtlaber. That's kind of fun. I think I'm going to say that again. Bartenbach Lichtlaber, um, they came up with a plan to bring sunshine into the darkness by installing 30 heliostat mirrors on the mountainside. And the idea is that these mirrors would grab light from the reflectors on the sunny side of the mountain and bring it around and shine it down into that village, bringing sunlight back into the town. Now, as you can imagine, this isn't a a cheap project. In fact, a few years ago, the cost was estimated at $2.4 million. I'm sure the cost has gone up since then. And the idea was that the European, European Union would share part of the cost, this company would share part of the cost, and this little village would share part of the cost. But you think about it, why would you spend $2.4 million for sunlight, right? Why would you do that, especially for a little village of 400 people? Well, it's because we weren't made to live in the darkness, right? We value light, and that's why they're willing to spend this kind of money to make this, this thing happen, right? We're not made to live in the darkness. It's very unsettling. Think about here in the United States, uh, our very own state of Alaska, the northernmost state. Uh, because of its proximity to the North Pole and its northerly latitude, several months out of the year, that state is in effective darkness, really most of the day, right? And, and you study the, 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 the trends, and what happens is during those months of darkness, what happens? Alcoholism, domestic abuse, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, just skyrocket during those months. Why? Because human beings weren't made to live in darkness. It's very unsettling. I remember when I was a kid, we visited Iron Mountain, Michigan. Any of you ever been to Iron Mountain, Michigan? It, it's, it's a little mountain, and as the name would suggest, there's an iron mine built underneath this mountain. They're still mining iron from this mountain to this day, I believe. And it's kind of a tourist spot. You can take tours down into some of these mining tunnels, and there are trains that you can go down there, and they make it all fun. They've got the big John in the iron mine there. And I remember as a little kid, we went down into these tunnels on these trains, and they had, it was, it was very dark, so they had lights about every several feet down through these tunnels. And it was a little claustrophobic. It's just rock on either side of this train, right? And they get you down several hundred feet below the surface of the earth where no natural light could ever find its way down there. And then they stop the train and they turn the lights off. 
And I tell you what, I have never felt such a dark darkness as that. It just was pitch black. You could almost feel the darkness kind of pressing in against you. I can tell you what, as a little kid, I was never more happy when they flipped those lights back on, right? Because there's something very unsettling about the darkness, right? We weren't made to live in the darkness. And that's why as we think about that unsettling nature of physical darkness, that's why that word darkness in the English language has become something of a metaphor. It's taking on something of a figurative language to, to indicate all that is evil and bad in this world, right? It's synonymous with all that's evil and bad in this world. So you think about it, what is Satan called? He's the prince of darkness. Uh, think about the demonic realm. It's called the, the, the forces of darkness. You think about hell itself. You're cast into outer darkness, which I think is both literal and figurative there. Think about when Jesus was crucified, that awful day when mankind murdered God. Jesus said, this is the hour when darkness reigns, right? And so you think about even the most evil demonic elements, it, it's associated with darkness, and even some of the more commonplace, difficult seasons in our life, we, we speak in terms of darkness, don't we? Many times people going through depression will speak of it as sort of the dark night of the soul. Many times when we go through difficult seasons, whether, whether through depression or anxiety or just financial difficulty, we'll say, man, that was really a dark season in our life. This word darkness has come to speak of, of everything that is evil and bad in our lives and really in the world. And, and we all have experienced those seasons, haven't we? We've all experienced our own seasons of darkness. And the good news that we'll see this morning from God's Word is that Jesus came to shed light in our darkness. Notice what he said in John 8, 12. Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Um, Jesus is the light of the world. And it's interesting, just to give you some context where Jesus was when he spoke these words, he was standing in the Jerusalem temple and it was at this particular time what was called the Feast of Tabernacles. And at this point in time, every year, in what was called the Court of Women, the, the priests would erect four giant candelabras. And, and they would light these candelabras. And historians tell us that those candelabras, those lights, emitted so much light that you could see the light from that temple for miles around throughout the city of Jerusalem, Right? And so Jesus is standing here in front of these brilliant, blinding lights, these candelabras, and in that moment he says, listen, I'm the light of the world. You're impressed with these candelabras because they can light up the city of Jerusalem? Guess what? I'm the light of the world. I bring light to the darkness all throughout humanity. Now, when Jesus said he's the light of the world, what, what does he mean here, right? Well, I think he's speaking in some respects both literally as well as figuratively. There is a very real sense in which Jesus is literally ultimate light. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 6.15. Jesus, who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This says that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's immortal, he's all-powerful, and he dwells in unapproachable light. It's as though Jesus is so, so beautiful and majestic and holy and powerful that his holy, holiness emanates from his being as, as radiant, radical, blinding, brilliant light. And the Bible says that no man can approach God in this way. It's unapproachable light. In Exodus 33, 20, it said, no man can see God and live. God is so holy, so powerful, so radiant. Right? His essence is, is of such a nature that, that mankind cannot even step into God's presence in his sinful fallen state and, and live to tell the tale. Right? It not only blinds us, but it would kill us. We'd be vaporized instantly in the powerful presence of Jesus' radiant light. Think about that. Now that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> because how do you approach a God who lives in unapproachable light? How do you approach a God as a sinful human being into the presence of a perfectly pure and holy God whose presence itself would kill you? That's a problem. How can, how can mankind ever consider approaching God? Well, God knew it was a problem, so he solved that problem by, by veiling his glory, by veiling the brilliant radiance of his being in human skin. That's what the incarnation was all about. When Jesus came to planet Earth, put on human skin, veiled his glory so that he could be approachable, so we could walk in, in, our mid, in his midst and we could know him and, and feel him and his disciples walked with him for three years on planet Earth, ministering him on those, on those dusty roads throughout Judea. And during that time, there were a handful of disciples who caught something of a glimpse of Jesus' radiant glory. You remember in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus took three of his closest disciples up onto a mountain, 
And Matthew 17, 2 says, Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. They saw at least a glimpse of some of this radiant glory as his face began shining like the sun, and his clothes began glowing with radiant light. Is this how you picture Jesus, by the way? So often when we think of Jesus, we might picture a babe in the manger, maybe a a good rabbi walking the roads of of Israel, maybe a, a bloody man on a cross, But this is who Jesus is in his unfiltered self, his natural, supernatural, divine being, a God of all light and radiance and glory, the creator whose very presence is so powerful that it radiates with deadly light. As we think about who Jesus really is, it should cause our hearts to pause and just just be still and to worship him, right? In a very literal, physical sense, Jesus is ultimate light. He is the light of the world. But Jesus also in the Gospels applies this concept of light to himself in figurative ways, and I'd like to look at some of those this morning. First, I'd like to notice that the light of Jesus produces conviction. It shows us our sin. I guess we could say he sheds light on our dark side. Notice with me some very familiar verses, John three sixteen and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. One of the most familiar sections of Scripture in all of the Bible. The the wonderful news that God, when He could have and should have rightly condemned a lot of us to hell, instead He did something absolutely amazing. He put on human skin. He came to planet Earth. He walked in our shoes. He lived the perfect life we could never live. He died the awful death that we deserve to die in the person of Jesus That was God hanging on the cross, taking on himself the death sentence that he'd issued against us, the death sentence we deserve to pay. Jesus came and paid sin's penalty for us. He died so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have eternal life. He rose from the dead so we could have new life in him. God loved the world, so he gave his son to do all those things for us, and and, and now he offers to us salvation, eternal life, not as a reward to be earned, but as a gift to be received by faith. When we simply entrust ourselves to Christ and say, God, will you save me? Will you forgive me? Right? He promises us, if you'll simply entrust yourself to me, you will not perish. You will not experience the hell that you deserve. Instead, I'll give you you a heaven and eternal life that you don't deserve. It's the free gift of God. Right? He didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come to judge us. He came to save us. Right? But you know, before he could save us, he needed to show us our need of a Savior. In order for us to see our need of a Savior, we must first see just how sinful and lost we are. And so while Jesus did not come to judge us or to shame us for our sin, he did come to show us our sin so that we would see our need of a Savior and turn to him for salvation. And yet, sadly, there are many people who refuse to do that, many people who refuse to acknowledge the depth of their sin and their, their ultimate need of a Savior, which is why verse 18 goes on to say this, he who believes in him is not judged, But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, listen, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. I mentioned earlier that we weren't made to live in the darkness. We don't like the darkness. The darkness is unsettling. We don't like the darkness except when we're trying to get away with something, right? (laughs) Then the darkness is our friend, right? Because the darkness allows us to hide. It allows us to live comfortably in our guilt and our shame and our sin. It enables us to ignore our conscience and to sleep comfortably even in the midst of our rebellion. And when you're sleeping comfortably in the dark, light can be a very uncomfortable thing. Uh, Many years ago when I was in college, I served as a camp counselor one summer at a camp up in northern Wisconsin. And throughout that summer, we had all different age groups come through, and I think our least favorite group that came through that summer as counselors was the second and third grade week, right? In my view, those kids are way too little to be off on their own for a week without parents, but but we had a room full of second and third grade little boys in each of our cabins, and all week long, we're reminding them, you know, please brush your teeth, change your underwear, all these kinds of things, you know, And, and, and bedtimes, nighttime was the worst. Because you'd just get the lights off, and it'd just be quiet, and then one little kid would burp, you know, and then another kid would do something else, and, and then it breaks out into all-out giggles, and it's like impossible to get these kids back to sleep. And finally, you know, you herd the cats, and you get them all quiet. It's dark. And that week, every single night, there was one kid in my cabin who woke me up every single night. 
it was something different. He'd have to go to the bathroom or he'd want some water to drink or he was homesick and he'd start crying, you know. And that's okay, right? That's what we were there for as counselors. It wasn't so much that he woke me up that bothered me. It was the way he did it. Now, most people, when you wake them up, you try to do it gently. Yeah, you nudge their shoulder a little bit. You speak softly. You try to rouse them gently out of their sleep. Not this kid. Okay, this kid, his parents had sent him with a flashlight. And it's not even fair to call this thing a flashlight. It was, I'm, I'm convinced he got it out of a lighthouse somewhere, right? This thing was so bright, I think it could have brought in a, a whole fleet of naval air force carriers, you know, in a hurricane. I mean, this thing was blindingly light. Most flashlights have like double AA, A, triple A, maybe D sized batteries. This thing was attached to like a car battery. You had to hold it with two hands. That's how big this thing was. And, and I'd be sleeping gently in my sleep, dreaming sweet dreams, and this kid would put that light right inches from my face and they'd just flick it on, right? And I mean, I just about fell out of bed. Oh my goodness, it was so uncomfortable, so unsettling when you're sleeping comfortably in your sleep. Light is not your friend, right? It, it just rouses you out of your sleep. It can be very uncomfortable. And, and, and sleeping in the dark, right, it's a comfortable thing. You don't want the light, but, but you know, sleeping in the dark and, and living in the dark can, it can not only be comfortable, but it can also be dangerous, right? Something dangerous about the dark. Um, we've all seen the old Indiana Jones movies, right? And they're kind of formulaic. Every Indiana Jones movie has a scene where Indiana Jones, the great archaeologist adventurer, he's making his way down into some deep, dark cavern, some tunnel, some long lost temple of doom, you know, and it's all dark and it's all scary. There's this sense of anticipation. When's he going to find the lost relic, the artifact, the, the great treasure? And, and, and there's a sense of fear and anticipation in the darkness. And then there's that moment when he steps out into the light. And rather than seeing the, the temple that he's looking for or the treasure he's looking for, what does he see? A pit full of snakes or, or, or poisonous spiders all over his back or scorpions or rats, right? And it's very unsettling. The audience jumps and Indiana Jones jumps because that light is uncomfortable and yet that's his best friend, isn't it, right? Seeing what the light revealed may make you uncomfortable, but the alternative sometimes is danger and death, as was the case with Indiana Jones, right? Ignorance isn't always bliss. What you don't know, what you can't see can hurt you. And that's why the light is our friend, even if it makes us uncomfortable. Here's the thing. Jesus knows there is something within each and every one of us that could destroy us. It could kill us. It's our sin. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have this sin nature within us, which produces all kinds of sins within us. And Romans 6.23 goes on to say that the wages of sin is death, right? The logical outcome, the, the consequence of our sin, if left unchecked, it will kill us. It will lead to death, not just physical death, but what the Bible calls the second death ultimate eternal death in the lake of fire. That's the just punishment for our sins. And by nature as human beings, we, we tend to be blind to our sinfulness. We, we can't see it, at least not the full extent of our sin, at least not the, the degree to which it poses very real danger to us. And so Jesus came very graciously to shed light on our dark side, to expose our sin, to show us who we really are, to show us our sins and the judgment which awaits us if our sins aren't dealt with. He didn't do that to condemn us. He didn't do that just to wag his holy finger in our face and tell us just how awful we are and to shame us. The reason he shines his light on our sins is so that something can be done about them before it's too late. Again, verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Remember when you were little kids in elementary school, I don't know if this happened to you, but every year, uh, we would have, I think it was called Dental Hygiene Week in our school, right? And they'd bring in a local dentist to, to teach you how to care for your teeth. And sometimes they would bring this, this guy would come in in this big tooth outfit, big foam molar outfit. It was kind of creepy as I think about it in retrospect, but they, they'd try to convince you to brush your teeth, right? And one of the ways they would motivate you was with, with kind of like a little bit of fear. They would give you these little red tablets. You remember that? You put them in your mouth, you swish them around, and then you spit out the red tablet, and wherever you had plaque on your teeth, it'd leave these ugly red spots just to show you how ugly your teeth were and how much junk was in them, right? Or sometimes they would take a little black light, and they'd have you open up your mouth and shine that black light, and again, it would show you all the, all the junk and all the stuff that was stuck in your teeth, and they're trying to scare you, right? And it did a good job, right? A little monster's in your teeth. You want to brush those things out, right? And it was a very kind of scary thing, but it, it showed you what was there, and that was a good thing because it motivated you to do something about it, right? In a way, that's what Jesus does, right? Jesus could have left us to die in our ignorance. He could have left us to die in the dark, but he loved us too much to do that. So he shines the light of his holiness into our hearts to show us who we really are. And he does that by his Holy Spirit. And I think there really comes a point in every person's life when we come face to face with our own sinfulness. 
the Spirit of Christ just kind of shows us who we are, and those are not pleasant moments, right? When you say something, something comes out of your mouth that is so, so utterly hateful and spiteful and wicked, and you're like, where did that come from? Was that me that just said that? Or, or that thought, whether it be a, a lustful thought or a hateful thought or a bitter thought or an angry thought or a doubtful thought, and it pops into your mind, and for a moment you entertain that, and you're like, wait a second, where did that, where did that come from, right? Or, or maybe you do something that you are so ashamed of that if anybody ever found out, you would just be utterly shattered, right? There are moments in your life where you see the dark side, and it's not pleasant, right? And, 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 and you go, where did that come from? And suddenly you have that unpleasant realization, that came from deep inside of me. That's, that's who I am, right? I'm a sinner at heart. It's not comfortable for that to happen, right? It's not comfortable when we come to that point in our lives. And in that moment, when we see our sin, we all have a choice, don't we? We can either step into the light and acknowledge our sin, or we can, we, we can d- withdraw deeper into the dark. We can turn to Christ for forgiveness and experience His healing and His restoration, or we can deny our sins and, and refuse to deal with them. And sadly, that's what many people do. Again, verse 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Um, Stepping into the light can be uncomfortable. Seeing yourself for who you really are can be unpleasant. Allowing Jesus to expose the sin that's in our hearts, it's painful, but it's necessary. Because it's only when we face up to the true problem that we'll ever find a solution. That brings us to our second point. Not only does the light of Jesus produce conviction, but it also provides clarity. He doesn't just shed light on our dark side. He actually shows us a way forward. Now, you know you're getting old when your eyesight begins to fail a little bit. When you can no longer do this, you kind of got to do this a little bit. Anybody there with me, right? You need some reading glasses. And it's difficult to read up close. It's also difficult to read in dim light, you know? And and so Elvie and I, on occasion, we enjoy going out to eat. And on special occasions for an anniversary or something, we might even go to a fancy restaurant. And fancy restaurants are fancy because they have beautiful ambiance, which usually means they're kind of dark, right? Dimly lit restaurants. They might have a little votive candle, a little, little uh, lamp at their table. But it's very, very romantic, very cozy, very intimate. And it's wonderful until they give you a menu, right? And then you, for the life of you, you can't read that menu. It's just too dimly lit. So what do Elvie and I do? We pull out our phones, turn on the flashlight app, and we're probably like ruining the ambiance for everybody else in the restaurant, but it's the only way we can read. But you throw some light on that menu and suddenly it's all clear. Light provides clarity, right? Or have you ever tried walking in the woods in the dark? That is a very unsettling experience because you can't see, you know, a few feet in front of you. And so you're tripping on tree roots, you're falling over, you're hearing strange sounds, animals in the woods. It's very creepy. But but just add to the mix, just to even the tiniest flashlight, and everything changes. Suddenly, you can see in front of you. Suddenly, you don't have to stumble in the dark. You can see your way through the woods. It's, it, it brings tremendous clarity. That's what light does for us. And what light does for us in a physical sense, Jesus does for us in a spiritual sense. Notice in John 12, 35, Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light, speaking of himself, Jesus. John 11, 9, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus here is describing the natural state of humankind right? By nature, we we walk in darkness. We stumble in our sin. We stumble in the face of temptations, yielding blindly again, over and over again to the same temptation. We we, we stumble in the face of trials, right? The, The pressures of life crush us over and over again. We stumble in the face of life's most difficult decisions, Sadly, many times we choose the wrong path again and again. It's almost as though we're, we're stumbling in the dark spiritually, unable to see a way forward, unable to, to find our way. And Jesus comes along and wants to shed light on our path, to give us the clarity, the guidance, to, to show us our way, our way forward through the dark. And, and that all sounds good, that Jesus is our light, but, but how, what does that look like? Like, how does he actually give light to our path? How does he actually guide us? Well, remember in John chapter 1, verse 1, John said this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John here says, speaking of Jesus, Jesus existed from from the very beginning. 
before time ever began, that Jesus was there, and he describes Jesus as the Word. Now, why does he describe Jesus as the Word? Well, think about it. What do words do? Words communicate. And when God wanted to communicate with humankind, what he didn't do is he didn't uh, send an airplane in the sky to do sky riding. He didn't send angels to give some divine message. No, he sent himself, Jesus, the embodiment of God himself to speak to us, to communicate with us. Jesus Christ is the very word of God embodied in human flesh. He's the living word. And so everybody that met Jesus encountered the living word, Jesus himself. It was an amazing thing. And you may say, well, Brent, that was amazing, but we don't have that today. We don't have Jesus physically walking in our midst. So how do we encounter the Word of God today? Well, even though today we no longer have the living Word embodied in Jesus, we now have the written Word embodied in the pages of Scripture. Notice what Psalm 119, 105 says. Your Word, speaking of the Scriptures, your Word, God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's the scriptures, it's the, the written word of God now that, that shed light on our path. And there's an interesting passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, you don't need to turn there, but here the apostle Peter was reflecting on that day we mentioned earlier when he and a handful of other disciples were taken up on that mountain and they saw Jesus transfigured in all of his glory, right? And he says, we heard ourselves this utterance made from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. They heard the voice of God and they saw Jesus transfigured before them. But he goes on in verse 19 to say this, we have the prophetic word today made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. What he's saying there is this, as amazing as it was to see the living word Jesus transformed in all of his glory, today he says we have a prophetic word made even more sure, something even better in a sense. And what's he talking about? We'll read on in that passage. He references the scriptures, the fact that the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of the risen Christ, entered into the hearts of men and caused them to write on, on paper the very words of God, the words that we hold in our hands today. Peter said, as wonderful as it was to encounter the living word, we now today have the written word of God, and that is every bit as much the word of God for us as it was the people walking and talking with Jesus. You know, if your Bible's like mine, many of them have red letter Bibles, right? Where the words of Jesus that he spoke on planet earth were, are highlighted in red, right? Well, that's, that's all fair and good, but in reality, all of the Bible should be in red letters, if you think about it, because really the Spirit of Christ is the one who inspired the writers of Scripture to pen the very words of God in this book. As we read this book, we are hearing the heart of Jesus. We are hearing the words of Jesus. This is the written word, and it does indeed act as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. You think about it, the Bible, God's word, answers all of life's biggest questions. It, it sheds light on, on our, our deepest questions. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I headed, right? The Bible answers those big cosmic existential questions. It shows us that, that we're part of God's creation, that his creation was good, and, and there's a good purpose in it all, but that it was ruined by sin, and God has been redeeming it for, for centuries now, and one day, Jesus Christ will come and make all things right, right? The Bible tells us where we fit into that ultimate story and gives us a sense of place and a sense of purpose. The Bible sheds light on, on the source of our true problem. Again, it's sin, right? But more than that, it sheds light on the ultimate solution to our sin, Jesus, who came to pay for our sins and rose from the dead so that by His Spirit, He can empower us to be the people He's called us to be, right? And the Bible not only answers these, these big kind of cosmic existential questions for us, but it also answers very practical questions on an everyday, day-to-day -day basis, right? Now, granted, it won't tell you um, the make and model of the car you're supposed to buy. It won't tell you the name of the woman you're supposed to marry. It won't tell you what color socks you're supposed to wear on any given moment. But make no mistake, don't undersell this book. This book has tremendous wisdom that will guide you in some of the most practical, everyday, day decisions. As we spend time in God's Word, the wisdom of God will rub off on us. We'll come to learn how to apply the principles and the precepts of God's Word to everyday decisions, and it will give us guidance. It will give us wisdom. It will help us to, to, to have light for our path to make wise decisions that will serve us and our families and those around us well. This is why God gave us this book. It's, it's a lamp to our feet and light to our path. He didn't just give us this book as a paperweight, as a, as a nice thing on our coffee table. It's a book that's a living book that, that we can learn from and grow in and, and spend time with God every day and, and, and draw on His wisdom. It is truly light for our souls. It guides us. You see, the light of Jesus produces conviction, it provides clarity, and it produces change. Jesus not only sheds light on our dark side, 
He not only shows us the way forward, but He actually gives us new hearts. He changes us. You think about the nature of light. Light doesn't just illumine things. It changes things. It changes the nature of things. If you question that, okay, go down to the beach. Go down to Galveston for an afternoon, right? And, and, and don't wear any sunscreen. Just hang out there for about eight hours, right? And if you're like me, you'll walk down to the beach lily white and you'll come back looking like lobster lavender, right? It, it will change you and you'll feel it for a number of weeks, right? Light doesn't just illumine you. It, it changes you. Um, we have a, a wedding picture that's been hanging in our bedroom for years, and a few years back, Ellie changed the frame. And as we took that wedding picture out, it looked great to us, but when we took the wedding picture out, we could see on the edges how much that picture had faded, right? And that frame had faded as well. And we put it in this new frame, suddenly it looked a little, little pale, a little dingy, right? Because light had, had changed, it had altered that picture. Um, and you think about it, sunlight doesn't change the, just change the appearance of things, it actually changes the very nature of things. Sunlight is essential to our health and our survival as human beings, right? We receive vitamin D from sunlight. It, it changes our chemistry. It makes us healthy. Without it, uh, we won't do well. Uh, think about it. Light is essential to the process of photosynthesis in plants, right? Without it, plants will die. Our world will die. Light doesn't just change the appearance of things. It changes the very nature of things. And what light does for things and people physically so too the light of Jesus does for us spiritually. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.13. Moses used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. And let me just pause and explain what's going on there. Uh, back in the Old Testament, when Moses ascended to the top of Mount Sinai to meet one-on-one -on -one with God, the Bible says that in some respect, Moses caught something of a, a glimpse of his radiant glory. Somehow he saw something of that, Right? And, and you think about it, um, sometimes you have a watch like mine, if you hold this watch up to a bright light and, and then you turn the lights off, it'll continue to glow. The dial will glow. It's kind of made to reflect that, that glowing light. Well, that's essentially what happened to Moses. <laughs> Moses went up on this mountain, he, he basked in the radiant glow and the glory of God, and when he came down, Moses was literally still glowing after the event. His face was glowing, and it was very weird and very distracting. The people of Israel couldn't even stand to look at it, so Moses actually had to wear a veil over his face while the glow of God's presence faded away. It's a very strange story, but Paul uses that analogy to say, you know what? The, the same impact that the light of God's glory had on Moses physically, it's the same impact that the light of Christ has on us spiritually right? The external presence of God impacted Moses in such a way that something of God's glory and presence rubbed off on Moses, and, and, and Paul says the same thing is true of the spiritual presence of Christ within us. As the spiritual spirit of Christ within us glows within us, as it grows within us, we'll begin to reflect something of the appearance and likeness of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 18, we all with unveiled face Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. For God who said, let the light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ in the face of Christ, so that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. When, when the light of Jesus, so to speak, takes residence in our heart, the Spirit of Christ takes up residence in our hearts, we find within us no longer just our own power. We're not limited to our own human resources. We now have the very power of God within us, and it changes us. The light of Christ transforms us and begins to transform us into his image so that we look more and more like Jesus and less and le less like ourselves. And you may say, well, well, what specifically does that look like, right? What does it mean to have the light of Jesus flowing in your hearts? Well, read verses 8 and 9. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. As, as we allow the Holy Spirit of Christ to increasingly take control of our lives and our hearts as we submit to his power more and more, as I said, we'll look like Jesus and less like ourselves. We'll, we'll no longer be operating in our own strength. We'll be operating in the strength of Christ. And slowly but surely, we'll have a new hope and a new comfort and a new strength and a new per perseverance that we never had before. This is the benefit of, of enjoying the light of Jesus Christ. And what we see here is that when we experience the transforming power of God, His light is not something to be feared. It's not something to be run from. It's something to be embraced. Because John 3.20 says, Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought 
in God. W- when we step into the light, we discover that it's, it's a healing thing, right? It's a good thing. We can embrace the light of Jesus because it transforms us and makes us the people He's called us to be. In summary, what does the light of Christ do in our lives? It produces conviction, right? It, it shows us our sin and our need of a Savior. It, it provides clarity, It shows us a way forward through the darkness. It it shows us the truth of God's Word and and the light that He can provide to guide our lives. The light of Jesus produces change. The light of Christ within us begins to transform us so that more and more we look like Him. He gives us new hearts. These are the benefits of of, of drawing near and stepping into the light of Jesus. And you may say, well, again, Brent, this all sounds good, but what do we do with this? How should we respond to the truth that we've learned this morning? Let me suggest two things. Number one, receive the light of Jesus. John 12, 46, Jesus said, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. John 12, 36, while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Uh, Jesus says, if you want to enjoy the benefits of my light and my power and my transformation in your life, believe in me. Believe in me. And what does it mean to believe in Jesus? It's, it's not like believing in, this, in Santa Claus or believing in, in, in the tooth fairy, right? I, I believe that that thing exists. No, to believe in Jesus means more than to believe that he is real or that he exists or even to believe certain things about him. That word believe in Scripture, it, it, at its core, it means trust. It, it's not believing something about Jesus. It's entrusting ourselves to Jesus. It's saying, Jesus, is as comfortable as it is, I'm going to step out of my darkness and let your holy light expose my sinfulness and take it and cleanse it and remove it and forgive it through your healing power. God, I want you to come into my life and make me the person you've called me to be. Will you save me? Will you forgive me? That's what it means to believe in Jesus, to entrust yourself, body, soul, and spirit to him as your Savior and Lord. And if you've never done that, let me invite you to do that this morning so that you can begin to experience the healing power of his light and his power and his, his glory and goodness in your life. Receive the light of Christ. And if you've done that this morning, secondly, reflect the light of Jesus. Jesus said, let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Ephesians 5, 8 said, formerly you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, right? Don't hide your light under a bushel, as Jesus said. Live in such a way that the character of Jesus is seen in all that you do and say. And as you go about uh, your life, as people begin to see the goodness and the light and the power of Jesus in you, they'll be drawn to him, right? That's why we're here. That's why he's left us here to reflect something of his light to a very dark world that desperately needs Jesus. Our job as Christians is to reflect the light of Christ to a dark world through the hope and the love and the joy that we bring. Scott McKnight, in one of his books, shares this, and it's interesting. He said, yellow is not my favorite color. But now that I know the story of Vincent van Gogh, I've come to value yellow differently. This famous Dutch painter, sadly, tossed away the truth that was imparted to him as a boy in his Christian home, and he sank into depression and destruction. By the grace of God, as he later began to embrace the truth again, his life took on hope, and he gave that hope a color. The best-kept secret of Van Gogh's life is that the truth he was discovering is seen in the gradual increase of the presence of the color yellow in his paintings. Yellow evoked for him the hope and the warmth of the truth of God's love. In one of his depressive periods, seen in this famous painting, The Starry Night, shown here, one finds a yellow sun and yellow swirling stars because Van Gogh thought that truth was present only in nature. Tragically, the church, which stands tall in this painting and should be the house of truth, is about the only item in the painting showing no traces of yellow. But by the time he painted The Raising of Lazarus, His life was on the mend as he began to face the truth about himself. The entire picture is blindingly bathed in yellow. In fact, Van Gogh put his own face on Lazarus to express his own hope in the resurrection. And McKnight goes on, he says, yellow tells the whole story. Life can begin all over again because of the truth of God's love. Each of us, whether in actual yellows or metaphorical yellows, can begin to paint our lives with a fresh hope of a new beginning. And he's absolutely right. This morning, God wants to apply the light of his love to the canvas of your life. So let me encourage each of us this morning to receive the light of Christ by faith and reflect the light of of Christ to those around us. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that you are um, a good father, that your son is the light of the world. And we pray this morning that if anyone's never stepped into the light and experienced his, his forgiveness and his healing and his transforming power. May today be the day that they entrust themselves to Jesus as their Savior and Lord. 
And Lord, for those of us that have, have done that, may we, may we live in such a way that we reflect the light of Jesus to those around us. As people look at the people of Cornerstone Community Bible Church, may, may they see such a, such a winsome, attractive joy and hope and encouragement and love and peace that they're drawn to the Heavenly Father and drawn to the light that they see in us. Lord, may that be true of us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.